I think what I'm going to do is talk about kind of the overview of where I see things right now in Oregon, because I think that the next six years are going to bring about tremendous change, and it's going to put pressures on us that we haven't really had before. Uh, Martin, you know, of course, about Oregon's minimum wage law. Yes, yeah, so that's what I'm going to be talking about in, at some length. Um, so the first thing, I mean, just, it's a small group, but I'm just curious about sort of what the level of mechanization is right now with growers. Um, so I'm just going to re run through kind of the, the standard pieces of equipment that people are using. And just a show of hands, uh, anybody using pre-pruners? Anybody using electric pruners? Like handheld ones? Yeah, handheld electric ones. Cane pullers? Okay, uh, under the vine cultivators. Well, about two. Starting about two. Yeah. yeah, about two. Which one? Are you, which one are you going to use? Probably it looks like one of the uh, a Ranieri and a sun, uh, sunflower. Sunflower. Uh huh. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and what is your primary reason for doing that? Yeah, yeah. There was a big wine scare in uh, California, you guys probably read about, because of uh, glyphosate in wine. They found trace amounts. And the industry is now coming back saying that you'd have to drink 12,000 bottles a day to reach the minimum uh, safety requirement for <laughs> for glyphosate. But but I heard the person, I heard the woman who... Uh, Who's who's really out kind of uh, talking about this on on JPR? I, I don't know if anybody else did, but it was downright scary, and they didn't have they didn't allow anybody to call in, which really upset me, because I, I thought some of what she said was really really off the wall. Um, I hate glyphosate. We use it. Um, so uh, just leafing machines. Anybody here? Okay. It's a piece of equipment we're, we're actually really, really interested in looking at. Um, anybody using thinning machines? That's something I don't really know anything about, Ryan. That's, I hope you talk about that some. Yeah. What about fruit thinning? Like, were you guys using uh, equipment to, to, that was what Karen was doing, right? We're using a machine To, to, okay. Okay, interesting. Yeah. No, I really, I really liked reading her, her study on that. Um, and then uh, harvesters. Okay. So those... Hedger. Yeah, hedger. Hedger, right. That's right. Probably everyone. Yeah. Yeah. Only one Yeah. 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 So you mean like an uh, overrow? Yeah. Which, and which one? Are, are you using the gear more with the tower? No, big, big rank. Uh huh. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, so basically, all in all, I think what, what we're looking at is really minimal amounts of of mechanization here in the valley, and that's certainly true with us um, at Quail Run. We do mechanical hedging. We gave up our oxen for tractors a couple of years ago, and we do. Uh, but that's about it. I mean, we're not doing anything else mechanically, and it's it's something we're certainly very interested in. I wanted to talk a little bit about kind of the overview of where I see the industry at this point in time and where I see things going because I think that will play hugely into how we think about labor and, and machines. And so I, and then I, I want to kind of temper that with some of my own personal thoughts about, about labor and uh, kind of how we, where, I, where I think the, the evolution of our industry is going because I think we're at a really critical stage right now. Um, so I've been doing lots and lots of reading about other wine regions. I've been very interested in how wine regions evolve. I've been doing lots of reading about individual uh, large uh, wine growers, uh, everything from you know Jerry Lord of the Mondavis to Gallo. And I think that there's certain patterns that I've really come to recognize in wine regions all around the world. And they're tempered in some places by... Uh, by laws, by policies that kind of have influenced the development. But in general, there's certain um, kind of you can call like market forces that drive the evolution of every industry. All of you, of course, have read Karl Marx, right? So you know all about this. And I, I'll say that I basically, as much as people reject a lot of, you know, kind of the market, Marxist ideas about how to, you know, have a... a, a 
you know, egalitarian society and everything. There's a lot of what he talks about that's actually really um, apropos to what's going on in grapes right now. And primarily what I would say is that there's a natural tendency in every industry, and we're seeing it in, in the, the grape industry and the wine industry, to have um, increased economies of scale, to have increased efficiencies, to have consolidation over time, and um, to have increased mechanization. And this is true of everything from the auto industry, and we're seeing it right now, I think, in the grape industry. And in a, in a, in a, I think it's just beginning. I think, it's, I think the, we're going to see huge changes over the next decade, is my guess. And basically, you know, anybody who's marketing wine nationally, you have a price point you have to hit. You don't have a lot of latitude with prices, so you have to do everything you can to keep your prices down so that you're competitive with places like California, where they're making $7 a bottle drinkable wine. <coughs> and, uh, you know, basically you have two models that I think are, are beginning to differentiate in Oregon. You have the, you, have the, you know, the boutique uh, $30 per bottle or an up um, Pinot Noir that's working on smaller sales uh, and larger profit margins. And on, on the other extreme, you have uh, you know, the $10 bottle that's working on these very minuscule profit margins, and they're making their money through large uh, sales, uh, large sales volumes. And I think that, that's the, that, that what we're seeing now is the beginning of this kind of bifurcation between these two models here in Oregon. Um, Oregon's done an amazing job, if for anybody who's attended the symposium, of maintaining a very high profit margin and very high bottle price. I mean, it's, it, it's absolutely astounding. The average bottle price of Oregon compared to California is what? It's about three or four times higher, I think, than the, uh, on average. And a lot of that has been really thanks to the Oregon Wine Board doing an incredible job of branding Oregon. Um, yeah, I hear all the time when people go out and sell wine in different regions of the country that the reputation of Oregon sort of precedes them arriving to try and make the sale. And you guys probably see that a lot, right? When you show up in a new area that doesn't have Oregon wine, everybody knows about Oregon wine, right? Yeah, I mean, nearly everywhere has Oregon wine. Now, yeah. But as, as they were breaking into markets, right, that was, that was uh, probably what you were experiencing. And, and that's rare. <laughs> you know, I mean, normally you're having to go in and, and, and make a hard sell, which is, which is really tough. Um, but I, I would also say that it's, it's precisely that reputation that I think is really going to instigate a lot of the changes that we're seeing. And I'll just mention, like, right now, Elowan is in here aggressively, right? And th that's a California winery. And what they see is Oregon bottle prices substantially higher than California bottle prices. Fruit prices are lower, and like, why, there's a huge opportunity. You had that with Kendall Jackson. And when Kendall Jackson first moved in up north, there was this kind of feeling that it was the beginning of a tidal wave. And it didn't really materialize yet. But there are people up sniffing around in the Willamette like crazy. Um, Precept is down here in southern Oregon looking for a thousand acres right now. And uh, Del Rio just to put, put in another 200 acre ranch. And you're going to have more and more and more of this is my guess as, as time rolls on. <laughs> and it's not, it's not bad, right? It's what people do to try and take advantage of, of, a, of a market and particularly of a reputation where you can go in and, and make a lot of money until you ruin that reputation. And that's, for me, the biggest concern. That's what happened in California with Merlot. Everybody, it was the most popular wine. You were probably in the midst of all this, right? And everybody jumped on. They started planting massive amounts of Merlot down around Fresno. The quality of the wine tumbled, and suddenly nobody is drinking Merlot. People attribute it to Sideways, but be long before Sideways, there was this huge, huge amount of, of really poor quality Merlot that was flooding the market. So I think that's one of, the, one of the things to be aware of that might be in the future. You're probably all wondering what this has to do with manual farm labor. So I'll get to that in just a little bit here. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, so you know, and, and I, I would say that um, 
you know, that, that one of the things that I've really come to realize, and I, I see this like Ryan with you with A to Z, is that you guys have a price point. You know, say you have a $15 bottle out there that you, that you guys are selling. It's a huge deal for you guys to raise it to $16. Right. If you have somebody who's like in there at fourteen dollars and they're trying to increase their market share, boy, if they can drop it from fourteen to twelve, they increase their market share hugely. So these are the kind of the larger forces that I see at play right now in Oregon, and that I anticipate are going to um, really, really begin impacting our state. So. One of the things I want to do is just also just like give a huge credit to A to Z because I, I think what you guys have done is you guys have made a, a really quality wine at a reasonable price. What I think we're going to see are people who are going to be making cheap wine. And I think we're going to, before that happens, I think we're going to be, see, we're going to see lots of people trying to make bad wine at a, at a good price. Or at a, not a good price of the bad one, but at a, at a price comparable to what A to Z is, is making. So these are all big things that are kind of, we're looking at as, as we look into the future. And to tie this back into labor, the, the other big kind of market influence I see right now, um, going back to Karl Marx, is, is labor. Uh, and minimum wage. And I, I've got to say, I'm really glad that Oregon passed a minimum wage law statewide because now we're all in the same boat together. I uh, always uh, have wanted to raise what we pay, but I can't do it alone. Everybody's got to do it together. But that said, it puts us at odds with companies that are having to maintain a bottle price. And the question is, who's going to, how are we going to navigate this as, as we move forward? And it's something that I'm sure we'll be talking about over dinner tonight. So um, to get back to labor, I just want everybody to kind of fully understand what, what's going on in Oregon. The, the new labor law it now put, gives Oregon the highest minimum wage of any state in the union. We are going to be having increases uh, each year for the next uh, six years that will take us to a, a minimum wage in 2022 of $13.50 an hour in Jackson County. Other places, uh, it's a little less. In Portland area, the metropolitan area, it's, it's 15. Is it 15? Yeah. And so, you know, Oregon is, has, has put this model in place. And just to kind of look at what that means. So in six years, if you take that difference, that translates into a 45% increase in what we are going to be paying labor in six years. And I was talking with Randy outside, and you're saying, oh, well, you know, things go up. But the CPI, which a lot of our contracts are tied into the consumer price index, is, is about 1.5%. So that means that there's a 6% each year for six years increase in labor. And there is uh, currently, California, I think, has a, on, on an initiative on the ballot for, for a labor, for a, a minimum wage increase that would equalize things between California. But most countries in this union are every Republican, hope there's no Republicans in the crowd. Every Republican state is fighting minimum wage as, as hard as they can. So, again, just another market factor. When you get a huge increase in minimum wage and you guys are trying to sell wine for $14 a bottle in a state that doesn't have a minimum wage and doesn't want a minimum wage, they don't care what we're paying for labor here. And you guys are stuck with how do you navigate that bottle price. So everybody's kind of... So I'll put it up there. So I want to I want to kind of translate this uh, minimum wage into some other numbers that I think just kind of help us wrap our heads about it a bit. Um, if you're producing grapes for two thousand a ton in 2016, and in our inst in our case, uh, about ninety percent of our cost in the vineyard is is labor. We have very very little over it. We are extremely. Uh, streamlined operation. That $2,000 a ton grape that it costs us $2,000 to produce now in 2026 is $2,800. So these are big, big, big increases. If you look at it a different way in terms of bottle price, uh, that $2,000 a ton grape, if say a, a winery is buying it at $2,000 a ton, that's about $270 a bottle in grape, in juice, right, that they're putting into it. 
uh, at the 2022 price, that's going to be um, 375. So that's inc- that's all these things are you know basically uh, increasing huge huge margins. And again, go back to that point that it, when you're at 14 dollars a bottle to go to 15 is a huge thing for you and you lose market share so everybody's in this together um and and how we're going to get out of it is the question <laughs> so um you know I, I, it, that's kind of the the general the general picture that i'm looking at on the on the large scale and what i want to do now is talk a little bit about some of the some of the more local issues around labor that I think also are going to really impact all of us. Um, who here was up at the uh, symposium two years ago when there was a, a lot of discussion about uh, labor uh, in this country? Anybody? Okay. So there was a couple things that were that were brought up there that I think are really really worth repeating. Um, one of them is that there's an absolute, uh, we're going to be seeing our labor pool dry up in time. It's going to go, start going down rapidly. And um, there's lots and lots of reasons for it. But one of the biggest ones is that uh, Mexico, the rural population, has gone from seven kids per family. And this is, I think, like 15, 10 or 15 years ago. It's an absolutely phenomenal change. I mean, it's like, like what they did in China. And it's gone from from seven kids to family to per rural family to 2.4. Average rural education has gone from second grade to ninth grade. There's all kinds of new opportunities in Mexico because the economy is really beginning to to improve, and they're at a point now where they're bringing in lots of migrant labor from Guatemala and Honduras. So there's a kind of a big again this kind of kind of uh, tectonic shift going on in the labor market. Um, In the U.S., uh, something that's interesting, I'm going to do my very, uh, here's my rudimentary PowerPoint presentation. (laughs) Ta-da! Okay, who can tell me what that is? Don't read it. (laughs) These are deportations. These are deportations in the United States. Obama, for all that he's talked about you know, coming up with a immigration policy. Every year that he's been president, he's deported more Latinos than any other president in history. Right? We're deporting nine times more people this year than we deported 20 years ago. And it's around 440, 450,000 people a year that are being deported back to Mexico. And you have a net exit of migrant workers returning more people returning to Mexico than you have coming into the United States at this time. So again, these are just massive sea changes in the labor outlook for our for our industry. The other thing that's going on, all of you are aware, is that we have a bunch of Cretans running for president who are apologies to you guys, who are demonizing, who are complete hypocrites who are liars, right? No, this is all true. We, de- we depend on migrant labor for our food. We depend on it for all kinds of things. And they're standing there screaming and yelling and pointing the finger to get elected. And it really it just upsets me so bad, especially because after the recession, I think people were very feeling vulnerable and those kinds of accusations and scapegoating really has resonated with a lot of the population. But that's, a, that's again, it's a, a huge factor on on labor and how labor feels and it, uh, experiences being in the United States. I know that there's a level of anxiety that my crew feels all the time. Uh, we've lost two people to ICE in the last two years. Uh, we managed to get both of them out. They both got picked up. It took a year and a half to get my very best guy out of lockup. And this resonates. Every time somebody in my crew gets picked up, everybody gets afraid. And it just, it's just this, uh, to me, a really uh, a, a terrible thing. And then the last thing I'll talk about with labor, I think, again, is part of this larger picture, is, is marijuana. Who here is growing marijuana? You. Okay. Thank you for being honest about it. No, I'm joking. He's, he didn't raise his hand. <laughs> okay. Well, <laughs> so... so uh, you know the the pot industry is 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 just out. It's it's crazy. I don't have a vineyard that I'm not surrounded by 
by pot farms. I mean, they're everywhere. And they're everywhere in the Applegate. And they're every rural community up in the mountains. There's pot farms. It is, it is crazy. Last year, trimmers were paying $15 an hour, right? And we were up against that when we were in harvest because you could go work for 10 hours at 15 bucks an hour, whereas our harvest, we'd be done in three or four hours. People earned a lot more, but it was shorter hours. And I think with the amount of pot going on, growing, you know, growing in the valley right now, that come harvest this year, it's everybody who's sitting there thinking they've got $100,000 of pot in their front yard is going to be looking for labor. And I don't know exactly how that's all going to play out. I have considered uh, hooking up with some pot growers and saying, look, at, we'll, we'll have the labor in the morning. We'll give them to you after we're done with harvest so that they can have two jobs, make more with us, but then have continue to work as opposed to losing people. And my crews are not comfortable with that. There's a lot of people that work with us in harvest who just have a real bad uh, feeling about the pot industry. A lot of them are from areas in Mexico where there's been huge uh, problems with the narcotraficantes that are just ravaging communities. But it is something that I actually did consider because I think it's going to make it really hard to find people at harvest to do picking. So all that said, you know, we're... We're, we're almost 100% uh, hand labor for our operation, other than, other than pruning. And we'll, at harvest, bring in as many as you know, 60, 70 people a day to help with, with harvest. We'll, during leafing, uh, we'll do passes where we might have 35 people that we're bringing on. <laughs> and I think as the labor pool dries up, as you know, we're hit with minimum wage, it's, it's just very, very hard for me to fully wrap my head around how it is that we're going to navigate these next six or seven years. Um, fortunately, we live in an area where there's a lot of pairs and there's a, there's a lot of back-to-back -back work, so people are apt to stay here longer they are, than they are in areas further afield. You know, at the symposium, there was one guy who said that when the labor pool dries up, it's like a, it's like a reservoir emptying, and it's the little channels that reach out that dry up first. And I think that we're going to be the last area to feel it, but I think we are going to feel it. So let me, uh, I'm probably taking way too much time. I'm just probably just skip a bunch of shit here. So, <laughs> you know, I guess I guess I just well, I'll, I'll just consolidate this to say that you know my feeling about manual labor it's a lot like my feeling about winemaking in general. I don't really look at this as just a business. Like we're uh, as a farm, we you know we want to keep in business, we want to keep moving forward. But I think we're a lot more into it for for the love of being in nature, for the love of working with really creative, wonderful winemakers that we have really strived to figure out how to grow how to put this area on the map as a great wine region and that that i think is you know somewhat influences my the way i think about labor because if you are just in it for money and it's very easy to do kind of econometrics and look at what is the cost of a machine versus the cost of labor but if you're in it for more than just the money and i would say that that same kind of relationship that makes it fun with the winemakers applies to the crew. I, I, um, I have this incredible respect for my crew. I, I, I love my crew. I, I love the people I work with. I know every one of them individually. I, uh, when we do harvest, all, most of the people working with us are family members, so we know all the families. We're involved in their lives. We've spent a huge amount of time trying to get them out of lockup with ice. <laughs> and uh, it, it's just a big part of what I love about this is our crew. And so it, it, that, is, that really kind of throws a wrench in it because you then have another variable that you're entering into this formulation of machine or men and women. And if you get a machine out there and, and you let it loose in your field, you have to recognize, we do, I do, that I'm letting somebody go. I'm maybe letting a bunch of people go. And one of the things that I feel is that that kind of somewhat predictable consistency of work, you know, we'll get crews in when we're, you know, pulling canes, we'll get crews in when we're suckering, we'll get crews in when we're leafing. And if you start c cutting in at various stages of labor, you're more apt to lose people. 
right? People are going to jump ship. They'll go get other jobs. And right now, there's kind of a housing boom happening in this, in this valley. And we're already seeing the influence of that on, on our labor pool. So <laughs> all that's to say that, you know, there's a, a kind of a, a way of thinking about labor that I think um, I have that is, is not just strictly business. And I think that probably is true for a lot of people in this industry. Um, so I wanted to talk about one other thing, which is that even if we have a labor increase or, or a minimum wage increase, I don't think we have an alternative to migrant labor. I think the, the, the people who I have on my crew, I, I'll just give you an example. When we had the 2008 recession, right, we had 15% unemployment in this valley. You'd think some people would show up looking for work on the farm. We had zero, not one person. The work is, I think, perceived as too hard, as below people. And even when everybody was like screaming about, you know, like people taking from the government and unemployment and all that, they chose to be on unemployment rather than come work on a farm. And that just said a lot to me about it's not like the labor pool, if it dries up with migrant work, it's going to be replaced by a domestic labor pool. I don't think it will. So it's just the hard situation. <laughs> You know, I mean, I'm sure everybody's dealing with this. Um, and then the question is, like, why, given all of this, why aren't we, like, immediately rushing out and mechanizing? And I would say that there's another way of looking at it, and this is, again, how we as, uh, uh, you know, as a business are operating, is that I, I am firmly of the belief that the highest quality fruit you get through really careful management of every single step you do in the vineyard. Every single pass adds up to the quality of that wine. And so I have, on the one hand, concerns about not cutting up parts of the labor pool that will make people jump ship and go look for other jobs and mean that we don't have them when we need them. But I, you know, I also think there's a really positive side. And, and, and I would say like when we're doing, for example, any pass, when we're do, whether it's leafing, uh, you know, we'll give, we'll give orders where it'll be like, you know, laterals on one side, 25% of the leaves, laterals on the other side, 75% of the leaves, or half the laterals. And we get in and we micromanage every single block to get what we think will give us the absolute best fruit. And I think our winemakers see it. I know from going up and tasting the wine that all of these improvements we've been doing over the years is making better and better wine. And so if you want to look at it in terms of kind of the larger picture of where things are going, I would say that in the future we're going to have maybe an increased kind of bivocation of the kinds of, the, the, of our industry. Right? We're going to have more people who are you know, kind of getting into the lower, middle and lower end price. That, that I think that that's going to have all sorts of issues that will play out. And then you're going to have people who are going to try and continue to make the maintain the high price, make ultra premium wine. And that as a vineyard, I think that our future is going to be kind of navigating these two different paths that we're going to be going down. Do you, do you have anyone... Who wants to buy Pinot Gris? I'm sorry, what? No. <laughs> a, lar a large scale grower uh -huh. that has, it, has the same uh, view of, of that world as you do. I mean, well, the, 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 the large scale growers are like Dick Braden, uh, you know, I think Del Rio, the one up in Umco, what is that one? But, no. Yeah, blue heron, and I think all of them are are very, very strictly mechanized, right? To, to the to the to the hilt as much as they can. Ryan, Ryan will know this answer better than me. They can they rely on hand labor for most operations. They machine what they can. Um, the difference is the, the people that Paul is talking about and the, you mentioned. They're farmers. Mm -hmm. they're, they're yeah. Yeah. That is, that's the most important thing to them, is the health of their business and for them to be able to deliver a product on a large scale with large economies to scale. Yeah. 
Yeah, and that's that large economies of scale thing that I was talking about. Is that you know, like one of the things that we're, you know, it's kind of our blessing and our curse is that we have lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of little blocks, and it doesn't lend itself to the kind of mechanization when you, that having you know a hundred acres of Pinot Noir or you know five hundred acres of Pinot Noir. We don't. We we have you know five acres here and four acres there and ten acres there, and it, it was just kind of the the way that we evolve, but it puts us at a tremendous disadvantage uh, compared to the larger growers. And I think what Ryan is saying, it's kind of what I have understood, is that all the bigger, the really large vineyards going in are, are really uh, mechanized as much as possible. There are, I can think of several other examples that are comparable to Quail Run that are larger operations, but that are really focused on hand labor and have a, a lot of value in their labor force. They're almost all examples of very high and high price point um, fruit and often doing what they do, which is a large operation but has lots of small blocks, often sells to small scale winemakers, and so that changes the game a lot. But like Michael's saying, I think those are the two, you know, that there is becoming a real big division between mm -hmm. the approach of yeah. who you're farming for, basically, and what it comes down to is where the, vent, where the fruit's going to go in the long run. When you end up going to operations, when the winemaking operation is focused on really large scale um, maybe you have a little bit less investment as well. Mm -hmm. That one two-acre block, that they can be absolute hundred percent best. Yeah, you know, best yeah. Block that they can make. And so that, that's a big driver for that. So just a question. Um, yeah. Could you talk a little bit about some of the challenges of just managing an in-house labor force seasonally? Because yeah. You can keep people on and. And either keep them busy or try to get them back when you have to lay people off for yeah. slow seasons. I mean, that's a real challenge for a lot of people around here. Take yeah, it. well, we, one of the things, I think one of the biggest things is slow season. What do you do? We, we actually give our, all of our permanent crew three weeks paid vacation. And that way, we work through the end of November. We'll and you know we'll even like find make work. I don't like doing that, but at times you kind of have everything done. Like last year, we had an early season, and we, we fortunately had a big vineyard we were putting in, so we were able to keep people going. But had we not, you know, it would have been like, well, at what point do you let people go? Um, and I think that the our, our idea of the of the paid vacation was that it's a way of of. Um, giving back to people, we give big bonuses, but also a way of kind of retaining people and making it really attractive to work with us. The result is that we have crews that have been with us, you know, 10, 12, 15 years who are extremely well trained, I mean, just really incredible at what they do. The temporary crews are largely, I think, what I was talking about, because a lot of the work where you would go and bring a machine in would be influencing more of the temporary crews than the permanents. And so that's where I, I, I you know, like I'm looking at leafing machines, I'm looking at cane pulling machines, I'm looking at pre-printers. We don't have that much on Cordon that a pre-printer makes sense, but I think we're doing more on Cordon and experimenting, doing a lot of experiments with Cordon. Um, but I think that that's a, the, the, so our permanent crew uh, is, is, you know, with us year round, and I think it's through making it a very attractive job. The temporary crew is the one that I, I'm actually really concerned is you could have dry up if you don't kind of prov provide year-round work. Maybe not full-time, but work that's kind of predictable. Um, I'm not sure if I'm answering your question. Yeah, basically, I mean, I think it's just a challenge for really big and small farms to kind of manage that seasonal need yeah. for labor. And actually, I think a lot of the, the bigger folks, I mean, us included, you, end up actually kind of sucking a lot of the, the temporary larger crews and some of the smaller folks actually struggle to find them. You know, I'm sure that's true. That's just... And, you know, I just was curious about your experience with that. How about um, any strategies, farming strategies, that you can think of that might be examples of how you've tried to either be more efficient or perhaps change the timing of things to, to fit better your labor availability? Or yeah, like well... Yeah, I can I I can talk about that kind of a little bit, maybe a little bit of a general sense. Um, one of the things that I'm a really strong believer in is just have, having really tight relationships with your crews. And I, we we have we have uh, a, a guy that I learned a lot of what I, for those of you who don't know, I learned what I know a lot from from Ryan and from Randy. I learned a lot from you, Martin, when you were coming. So like in my early days when I was just getting into this, I didn't have any training, and these these guys are like my my teachers so i'm really appreciative you guys i i thank you for that
Um, the other thing I've really come to realize is that we have this huge institutional knowledge within within the crew. So I mean, this is kind of a roundabout way of answering your question. Um, th- that that institutional knowledge is 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 so critical to getting everything done right. We have one guy, just to show you how different things have become. Uh, uh, Alberta, who worked with us, who would tell me stories about being out in fields with crop dusters flying over spraying f- crews down in California. This is just done regularly. So there's this p- past that I feel is so shameful. Uh, what I have done, I would say that the main thing I've done is to, to really kind of get away from the hierarchical structure that farms operate on and to really involve our crews as much as we can in all of the decisions that we're making and to delegate downward as much as we can the responsibility so that people who would normally just have somebody driving around telling them what to do now are making decisions and it's gone a a huge distance towards getting people to feel a real sense of ownership and pride in what they're doing I, i can't emphasize how much that's changed things in our in our vineyards and the other thing that we've also done is really get a lot of uh not instead of a downward hierarchical kind of communication where orders are being given always from above, what we're always doing is asking everybody to come up with any ideas, bring them to us. And so we have meetings all the time in the field with our crews to talk about things. We're going to do a pass. Any ideas about how we can do this better? And through that, like one, a lot of right now, we're, we, the way we raise catch wires is completely different because one of our crew had figured out that they could do it in a much, much more efficient way. We're now doing lots of experiments. We have 14 or 15 experiments going on in the vineyards right now. All of them are being directed by the crew. Everybody is told, here's what we're doing, here's why we're doing it, here's what we're hoping to find, but we don't know how would you do this best. So I spent all morning with Antonio working, we're working with Cross Arms. Ryan is up north. I, I think it's a hugely promising thing here in Oregon, but that was uh, involving I- Antonio and Ramiro in coming out and walking it and spending an hour looking and saying, okay, how are we going to make this work? How would you guys do this? And involving them and doing that with all of our crew has and speaking Spanish. I, 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 I've kind of learned Spanish from my crew and everything we do so that, so that they're, that, that same kind of relationship that I have with winemakers where I view them as collaborators and every year I go around I taste all the wine made from every block so that I can learn from them how to do things better in the vineyard, I have that same relationship with my crew, and I view them as as the collaborator, as my collaborators. And if we're a team and working together, incredible things happen. And so, yeah, I mean, every every step of the way, we've been figuring out how to how to improve things. And it, it's everything. It's not just always passes. Sometimes it's just irrigation, being involved in looking at a block and saying, "Hey, this you know something seems wrong here. Can we walk through and look at this?" So. That's the main thing. I, um, I don't. I, there's lots of other speakers that should be done, but yeah, that's that, that 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 is the primary thing. I think that there, you know, like you can pay people better, you can, you know, give bonuses, you can do all that. But ultimately, I think what is working for us best at Quail Run is that everybody's part of a team and they feel really deeply respected and that their opinion matters and that their participation is expected. They're not just going to be told what to do. They need to take ownership. Okay.